Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Marshall Way podcast. Today, I have a very, very special guest, someone who I've been uh, looking forward to talking to for quite some time, someone who is no stranger to any of you. She is a world champion, uh, tremendous accolades that I can't even list here because if I did, it would just eat up the entire podcast just on that alone. Uh, but it is someone you all know, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy just as much as I will. So without further ado, Miss Sensei Emma Markwell. Hi. Hi, Scott. How are you? <laughs> Good. That was our second intro because I kind of butchered the first one. I'm always, I'm always going to pretend that you did that on purpose to make me uh, feel a little bit less nervous because I know uh, you know that I'm a little bit nervous on screen and, and perhaps a little bit shy. So um, I'm going to pretend that you did that just for me. <laughs> sure. Fair <laughs> enough. But I trust me, everybody is. And we have these discussions. Whenever I do these things, that's the thing everybody discusses beforehand. Like, oh, I, I'm going to feel awkward. I'm going to do whatever. And it's like, no, it's just, we're just out having a pint or something, just hanging yeah. out this chat. It's funny. You wouldn't imagine like all these big butch karate people to be so nervous, would you? But yeah. ah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's why they do it, just because that's the facade they can carry. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're known in all circles. Like, it doesn't matter which organization, whether it's IFK, IKO, irrelevant. Everybody knows Emma. You're, <laughs> you're so well known. And you, uh, um, obviously, you have so many championships behind you. How did it all start? Where did young Emma get the oh. urge to uh, get into Kyokushin? How did that all happen? Yeah, so... Uh... I was about nine years old and um, I had a friend who just started karate and I think it's quite popular around that age, especially it was like 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so I was about nine years old and my stepdad, I was actually really lucky, he already did Kyokushin um, at uh, one of Hanchi's dojos in Wimbledon. So um, yeah, I think maybe even just as much to give my mum a night off a week, um, he was like, off we go. Um, and I started there. So yeah, what's that, 1999 or something like that now? Um, and yeah, I mean, I was really lucky, got to got to go to Hanshi's Dojo, um, which I'll probably, probably be able to tell you a little bit more about as well. Yeah. Um, but I just have a really, really uh, strong memory of something that happened to me when I was quite young and at school. Oh, do and, tell. <laughs> yeah, well, I, funny enough, I, when I was sort of trying to think of things um, that might be interesting for people, this did come up into my head. Um, and I remember, uh, uh, I don't know if you have the same system in Canada, like school assemblies. Oh, yeah. With, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone gets to sort of sit down and the teachers talk and things like that. And I remember one, one girl in the same class as me being called out the front of the assembly because she'd got some kind of award in gymnastics and she was doing amazingly. And I must have been about seven at this time, seven or eight. And uh, I had this really strong feeling of like, oh, if I if I if I want to be really good at something, I can't it can't be something like gymnastics or dance because really I already need to be good at it. I'm, I'm, I'm about four years too late already. And like a seven year old me is wow, really, that's pressure. Like, it's a bit intense. Um, but yeah, and I had this really, and then I think when I got into karate, I sort of think, I, I think I latched onto this, like, this could be my thing. This might be it. I, maybe I'll be good at this. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's basically how it kind of started and how I, how I, was well, why I'm perhaps I was so tenacious so young but yeah and, and what was it about it like uh that made you even want to stick once you got in there and I mean I know you're only nine but you're going through the kata syllables and all this I'm sure you started sparring and stuff was there anything specific or was just was it the exercise or was it the discipline of it or I suppose if there was something specific you'd have to say Hanshi um ah. <laughs> getting to train with him um like the way I did twice a week, every week. And for me, that was like my norm. Um, I perhaps didn't appreciate till I was a little bit older, just kind of what an inspiring character he is in the dojo. Um, you expect a like a scary man kind of shouting, God damn it at you as, as like a nine year old to be really terrifying. And yeah, absolutely it was. But equally, it didn't ever, it didn't ever make you like run off cry. Well, maybe a couple of times, but <laughs> run off crying. Um, it made you just want to do it more and harder all the time. So uh, I think I think that was that was probably a really big part of the sticking point for me is just you always wanted to he always made you want to try a little bit harder. Um, 
he's a he's an incredible um motivator and inspirer he just brings something out of you even now when we go to summer camp and uh maybe like I'm a, a little bit soft on my basics or something and then the minute he looks at me I'm like oh I'm doing it so hard because he just makes me want to do it better um so I think that that definitely got me hooked as it were um yeah, there wasn't loads of competitions uh, for us at that age in this country. Uh, we had a couple um, a year. We had like a Kata tournament and a Clicker tournament. Or I think it started as, when I was started. It was Wuko, but then it moved on to Clicker, uh, and we'd have one of each in a year. Um, but yeah, so I think essentially it was probably a lot to do with Hanshi and the fact that my stepdad um, took me and you know religiously took me and then took me home, went back to training himself, came out, you know, he, he ferried me to and from everything. So um, I suppose I had no reason not to. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though, that you had somebody in your life that, uh, you know, took you there like that. And we see it at the dojo, too, and I love it. You'll see some um, parents that we have who will come bring their kids to the kids' class. They go back, drop them off, come back then to the adults' class themselves. Yeah. And I think it also gives the kid a really good um, kind of, example of yeah. what, uh, like you know oh well if you know mum or dad can do that and they're that committed that they can do that then I can be committed too so yeah and, and it's so neat to see like we again we have some that uh now some of those kids have now graduated to the adult classes so now you have mom or dad with the kids in class it's really I, cool I remember that me like training next to my stepdad and yeah right yeah it's, it's very, very cool yeah, and, really and and Hanchi, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I got the experience to meet him a few years, actually, when I met you, actually, as well, in person at the summer camp. Um, and I remember being meeting him, and you don't know what to expect, because it's he's Hanchi, he's the head of this organization. And I remember being just so nervous, so when I met him, uh, it was in, you know, around those dormitories that they had there. And, and <laughs> so I go up to him, Os Hanchi, it's, uh, it's such an honor to meet you. I know I was nervous with that, blah, 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 blah. And uh, he jumps on me <laughs> on the couch, kisses me on the cheek and goes, what do you think of me now? Yeah, <laughs> I'm he, like, oh my God, he's I like know, a he's grandpa. Very, he's very warm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then uh, the next day in class, to your point, yeah, he's, it was yeah, so intimidating. Know, terrifying, but very warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like to be all of those things at once, isn't it? Yeah. It's, and it's great to see him still uh, active and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. He's got a energy yeah he's great so when uh you you alluded to uh starting competing like in clicker and things like that when did when did the full contact side of it ha happen uh so pretty much straight away um as well as soon as i could as i uh, i should yeah. say um so as i yeah as i was saying we had the, these competitions i i started those as soon as i could as well like my stepdad would enter me for everything and to be honest i i wasn't particularly good um i didn't have really Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I no. thought you were like a natural I, from the start. No, no, no. I didn't. I don't think in the clicker and kata, I didn't get past the first round for at least four years. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I don't remember sulking about it too much at the time. Like, well, definitely on that day, I'm a bit of a sore loser. But then I, I just wanted to go back to karate. It didn't really matter. Um, and then Les took me to Crystal Palace. Les is my stepdad. He took me to Crystal Palace to watch the uh, the British Open. Uh, um, that sparked a little bit of something or something in me, like Ooh, this is this is my, up my street. Um, and then I, I, I he took me to some of our junior squad trainings, which at the time were being held by um, Shian Andrew Turner. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew really, yeah, really, again, another inspiring coach. I'm very lucky to have had lots of them in my career. Um, but he took uh, me to a few international events. Um, this is still in Clicker and Catter at this stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then, then I, I'm sort of maybe 15, 14, 15 by now. And that's where I started picking up maybe like the odd little trophy. Um, age 16, he took us to the first IFK um world tournament and by that time we could fight knockdown as cadets but in Europe still right. not in the UK um so I went I went to that competition and at this point I'm still doing the other the the cutter and the clicker as well um at different times and I went to that that competition but that definitely ignited something in me that I was like 
this is it this is what I want to do um I remember at that competition there was a it was it was the first one and the entries were quite low especially in the cadet knockdown um and in the girls category that I was in there was me and two Russian girls and that was it and so my first uh, ever knockdown fight was okay it's, it's an IFK Russian then great um <laughs> <laughs> you know the killers right away it, you know it got it over and done with didn't it and then uh yeah and I I did lose I did lose that fight and so I came like a, a third of three um but again like I say it really ignited something in me um so then I kind of carried on on that path a little bit more and I think I, I suppose I started to choose that path a little bit beyond the catter and clicker um but I, I did I did eventually do I, like a, just a suggestion that perseverance does pay off. I did eventually do OK in Catter and Clicker as well. I think I won um, both British titles, uh, both of them. Yeah. Like, OK, I'm happy. Like that, all that perseverance of like eight, eight or nine years of doing this every year and losing all the time, it, it paid off. And then, yeah, and then I just started to pick my direction more towards the knockdown side of things. And what about knockdown that made you gravitate there? Like, I'm just curious. I mean, it, not everybody. You, I mean, we see it in the dojo even, like, it doesn't matter, male or female. It's it's not everybody wants to go. Yeah, it, no, and I totally understand. And I suppose it's a mixture of lots of things. Um I suppose I, my stepdad Les had done a couple of uh, a couple of years. He'd fought in the British Open himself, mm -hmm. um, so I think he'd always kind of instilled in me that like if you're going to do this karate, ah. it is what it is. Like <laughs> um, you know, Kyokushin is like, we're supposed to be like the strongest karate, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. Um, and I think he kind of always just sort of suggested to me like, well, if you if you want to do this properly, it's about this bit of it. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. And so yeah, like uh, I suppose all the influences I had were um you know, I was very lucky that they all kind of led me down that lane. And I said, I like a bit of a challenge. I like to work really hard. And I like, I like that it's for me and it's individual. Yeah. Um, and that I, I, I know that if I work hard, I'm going to do okay. Maybe not win, but I'm going to do okay. And if I don't work hard, then I won't. And it's, you know, it's down to me. It's not down to my team or, or down to it's, it's me. So yeah, maybe that's what I like about it so much. Yeah, and I and, and I find a lot of people who are drawn into karate. It, it, they feel the same way, and uh, um, yeah, and it floods over to other sections of your life too. I find that mm -hmm. yeah, if you want to, that individual perfection, it will start, you know, irking its way over into other things. What what did your uh, what about friends and family, schoolmates, all that? What did they think if? Uh, this young lady that was in school all week and then going off and yeah. knocking the crap out of people on weekends. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm super supported and I'm very lucky. Um, I know, I think I've written one post on Instagram or on social media once before that got a lot of likes about like how my mum would do my, my buttons up one time when I had a broken hand. <laughs> um, now, as I say, my, my stepdad is super instrumental in, in, where I went with karate um, and also he prepared me very well for it in uh, like a more of a mental capacity as well uh, I remember him, when I was quite young still him telling me like if you want to do this and you want to do it well it's probably going to be quite lonely mm. um, and like and I just took that like oh that's just what it is then so I was never surprised when it wasn't a glamorous sport um, <laughs> and have you found it lonely uh, pfft, uh, like a yes, lot of training on your own and yeah uh training on my own I I suppose yes you've always got to do some and you've got to yeah every knockdown fighter knows that you know if you want to do that little bit extra yeah you're going to find to, you're going to find yourself training alone but I I've had so many good um training partners and um session like sessions and coaches and so I've never felt super alone in that way mm. um I suppose more lonely like you never expect it, but like if you've had a, 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 a specific success right. and that can feel quite lonely right? Uh, because suddenly you're like, oh, the next time I fight is quite, is quite daunting or, and that's maybe like a, a slightly lo lonelier place to be. Um, so not lonely is in the, in the training itself. Also, you know, you're working so hard, you can't really think about being lonely, can you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but 
yeah, maybe there is a there is an element of loneliness to it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. It absolutely does. Uh, and what about? I mean, you started obviously climbing up the ranks uh, to a point where I mean, you are now. But what made you pursue it at that level? Uh, was there like you just felt that you know what I might be able to do this? Or well, I think the fact that we had to go abroad to fight under eighteen in this country mm-hmm. um, probably meant that it didn't seem unusual or scary to me to go abroad to chase the tournaments and things like that so it it didn't seem like something that I wouldn't do um but also I had a a, a good success in a tournament in 2009 um the All Kyokushin World Tournament yes. which was in Budapest and it was um sort of the the it was pre-KWU um but it was that it was the same kind of emphasis. It was with the same, it was just before that came and it was um, with the same idea. And so lots of groups got together and we put in an IFK team. Um, and I was uh, 19 or I think a 19 and I got picked to go in that team. Um, so perhaps a little bit of a wild card because it's, this is an IFK um, international team. So we're like, I think six girls or maybe maybe more like eight or something like that but mm. from all over the world not just mm. great britain so um really really lucky to sort of have got the chance to go but i i had some real success there and um i came third overall and it was a three-day competition so it was like my first kind of like real taste of bloody hell this is you know uh, <laughs> This is on a big scale. And uh, I suppose after that, it just felt natural that I wouldn't just go back to competing nationally, but I, I would just always kind of chase those higher level tournaments. So that's kind of where I wanted to be. And to this point, what's been, what's what's the biggest one or the, uh, the most, the one that you're probably proudest of at this point? Oh, I think that's really a really difficult question. Um, Cause I obviously my, my knockdown career has spun quite a yeah. lot of now, like, getting on for 14 I think so it's quite it's quite difficult to pick something because I am I am genuinely proud of what I've done um am I allowed to, am I allowed to pick a couple of course you can it's your show <laughs> <laughs> definitely 2009 that competition to have come third overall um my first fight I was drawn against the top seeded Russian mm-hmm. um in the first round and uh I just remember having this feeling of like, I haven't done all of this work to lose to you first in two minutes. Like, um, and so, and then, oh, I actually, I can tell you a really funny story about this tournament as well. Oh, please. Um, <laughs> I got to the semi final and I lost the semi final on the third day. And uh, I asked my coach, Shian uh, David, um, do I have to fight again for third place or, um, or am I done? Mm. Like, a joint third place. And he said, nope. It's a joint third place. Off you go. Go and enjoy the rest of the day. You've done brilliantly. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm sitting down having a Snickers bar. <laughs> it's like half, half a Snickers bar at this point. And I hear Emma Markwell to the tatami for third place fighter. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> so Shane David's come run, running up the stairs to me. He's going, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm like, well, I can't fight. Like, you know, um, and so we're sort of running down the stairs and he's going, oh, go on, just just try, just try. Like, if, it's not, if it doesn't go well, we'll just chuck the towel in, just try. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, so I'm stormed onto the mat, like, so angry. And I had this fight and uh, I think it was three rounds, again, another against mm-hmm. another Russian. And I did win it at the end of the three rounds, which is amazing. Um, but I just remember coming off that tatami and just being like, ah! <laughs> and I just, Tried for like the next hour because I was just so emotional. But so yeah, that that is um, that is a tournament that will never I'll never forget. Um, but as I say, there's a there's a couple of other things that I'm super proud of. I'm proud of the fact that I've won the British eight times now. Which is, <laughs> you know, uh, it sounds bonkers to me to say it out loud. Yes, uh, because that's my favourite tournament. It's the one I was taken to watch as a kid, and I just love it. Um, and then I'm super proud of having won the world title in KWU last year. Yes. Um, I don't know if yeah, if you'd sort of seen the previous KWU tournaments that I'd... Oh, yeah. I'd, this is the the fourth world tournament, and I'd fought in all four, in the final of all four, and come second in the first three. So I'd started to feel like a little bit like, I suppose maybe 
cursed or frustrated like why am I like what is happening um but you know what it made the victory this time even sweeter um but I'm proud of the fact that I could like dust myself off a fourth time um and still attempt it and you know if it hadn't gone my way again I probably would just be at the next one trying again (laughs) It's your spirit, but no, it was so amazing. I remember, I, yeah, I, I watched them all and uh, seeing you on the podium there. It was, it was pretty amazing. Oh, yeah, thank congratulations. You. Thank you. So, what, what is your tournament prep training like when you're leading up to these types of uh, events, especially at that kind of level, like where you're facing like some amazing fighters from around the world? Yeah, uh, it's evolved a lot. I would say from what it was when I started. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, when I started, as I said, I was still doing kick, clicker and cutter and things like that as well. Um, and at Hanshi Sojo, there was always a bit more of an emphasis on your basics and your cutters, etc. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of uh, knew that I had to maybe make some changes um, in order to be um, a little bit more knockdown focused. So I started going to the Crawley. Um, Saturday training session, which is where loads of the fighters would go. Um, and I was just really lucky that maybe I came into it at a time that there was some, there was a really good team of sort of strong and experienced fighters already there. Um, and I, yeah, I sort of joined the team at a time that um, some teammates like, like Kelly Barmer, Wei Chung, um, Leah Howlett, Chris Seal, they were all there training. And I was getting to like as little 16 year old me was like getting to see um, how these people that were winning tournaments, how they were prepping. And so that was a big turning point for me in like learning like, okay, you know, a couple of times a week at the dojo and a little bit of running. It's, it's not yeah. going to cut to do it. I need to do a bit more. Um, I mean, those sessions are pretty brutal. We, uh, I'm still doing them 14 years later. Um, yeah, my so friend they, Pavel went to one yeah. of them. He told me all about He said it was yeah, pretty hard. Yeah, they're tough. Um, but they make up a big bit of my prep because I know that, you know, I base my week around that session. Um, so as I say, the training's definitely evolved. I started picking up some weights, um, doing a lot more training like that, um, making my cardio training a lot more specific. Um, so, uh, what, an what, average Do you mind week, me asking, what type of cardio training do you do? Is it, uh, is it running or do you focus on more interval type training? Or I love running, but I've got a little bit of an injury at the moment that means that running is not my friend right now. Right. Um, so I'm doing a, well, apart from at the moment, because you can't get in a swimming pool. Yeah. I've, I've been doing a lot more swimming. Um, yeah. That's what I was doing a lot more of in the last couple of months. But um, yeah, so I kind of uh, have like st- phases of tournament prep. So if it's like a 12 week or 16 yep. week or eight week or whatever, but a like a bit of a strength endurance phase, a little bit of a kind of middle phase and then the, the yep. sort of taper and, you know, sharpening up phase at the end. And so in that first phase, I probably do a, a little bit more kind of distance and just endurance and really build my base fitness. And then in that middle chunk, that's where I'll like work a lot more interval work. And then that last bit, I, I drop a lot of that. And then I just maybe do a few sprints and things like that to keep sharp. So, um, yeah, definitely. There's a little bit more. It's a little bit more systematic now. Now that I understand what my body kind of wants and needs, um, and then there's also the fact that I'm a little bit older, so my training's changed again. Just I am, um, but just in terms of my own body, you know. I think we have we have something called like a training age, mm. and um, you know, you know when you need you need a little bit more volume or when you need a little bit less volume, but the right stuff. So um, yeah. So you do you tailor each uh, session or each um, uh, event that you're getting ready for. Is, is it different than the previous one or is there a theme yeah. that you kind of. There'll always be, like I say, everything's always built around those right. sessions. Yeah. So there's always a bit of a, like a similarity we have in those Saturday sessions. We kind of have to know we have a circuit and some pad work. Right. Bar and, stuff. and you, you keep the same components. So whether it's your weight component, your cardio component, um, your sort of rehabilitation for any injury components you keep all of those components but the bits that you're doing within those components might change and so the on, focus of them yeah, yeah. so on maybe one one tournament i've just been like when i was a lot younger i was focused, it was just about getting a lot stronger right. um now maybe my strength training is a little bit different focused and it really does just depend on and like what the season before was like like last season was killer um i did the the british into the into japan into kazakhstan that was killer so coming back to train again for turkey which sadly didn't happen my my training had to be a little bit different because otherwise i'd have been 
exhausted. So, yeah, no, no kidding. Um, but even the actual events themselves in the tournaments, you, uh, do, do you find when you come back from those, just going through them, has, has your um, I don't know, skill, for lack of a better word, improved? Do you, or people around you notice that as well? Because that's what I hear a lot. Like people who do do tournaments and stuff, when they come back, there's mm -hmm. something about just being in the tournament itself that actually um, just makes a change with them somehow. Yeah, I think you have like a just a, maybe an inner confidence in yourself to know that like I I can stand on the mat in, in a in a place that I'm putting myself out there to be hurt mm. and I and I'm okay like and I'm you know whether win or lose um I, I'm I'm standing here in the dojo and I'm fine and I clearly really want to do this so mm. I think you have like maybe a bit of an air of confidence um and yeah uh I don't know if I I suppose. Like I said, it's a lot of years, but just over year on year of that competing, definitely my style of fighting has changed. Um, what would you call your style of fighting? Or how would you uh, define it? Whatever it takes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you have some people who are more defensive, some people are more offensive. Um, you know, how, how would you define your particular style? Yeah, well, I suppose I've become more offensive as I've got a little bit older and a little bit stronger, and I believe that I can hold my ground against people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I try to, well, I hope I try to um, pick the right times to be offensive and defensive. Mm -hmm. So if you know the fighter that you're going to be fighting, and obviously it's, you know, they could also be hatching a plan against you, but um, if you kind of roughly know the way they might fight you, maybe you can decide whether you're, you know, whether you're going to be, like, you're going to step out to start with a little bit more defensively, or if you're going to step out to start with aggressively. And um, I hope I try to, I try to do that. Um, reading each fight as one fight and not trying to fight a whole tournament. I think I've, I've had tournaments where I'd, I, I could say like the first round fight is a completely different fighter to the final fight or something like that. Um, it just depends what's going to work at that time. Do you try to analyze the fighters ahead of time? Like, do you know who you're potentially going to be facing? Do you watch tape? Do you uh, try to train specifically for fighters? I suppose on the, those um, international events, you do start to get to know lots of the people on the circuit. So yeah. you perhaps don't need to Google all of the names because most of them you'll be like, oh, I know her already. I know her already. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe when the, the names come up on a website or something, you might just think, oh, I'll just have a little Google. But I don't really... Um, and I don't, I don't particularly fuss over the the draw or anything like that because I just think, well, you've got to fight who you've got to fight, and it's never going to be as bad for me as it was in two thousand nine getting the <laughs> top well, I mean, it will, it can be, but it can't be worse than that if that makes sense. Yeah. It's you know, it can't get worse than drawing the top seed in the you know. So you just think, well, you got to fight who you got to fight, and there's no point in getting too wound up about it. Um, listen to your coach; they they got your back, and mm. yeah. What, what, what's been the hardest thing that you've had to overcome for all these years of training and uh, of tournament fighting? Uh, I suppose the injuries that kind of are in, an inevitable part of fighting so much. Like, mm. you, you know, I, I think most years I get on the mat maybe like five, six times or something like that. Um, and the training itself like that's maybe 12 or eight weeks of time of putting your body through loads and then the in, the tournament, the impact injuries themselves. Um, so you, you spend a lot of, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking like, well, this is a little bit achy and this is a little bit dirty. And um, so maybe that's the hardest thing is that as you collectively get a few more of those achy and hurty bits and you still got to go training and you still got to, yeah. yeah, maybe that's the hardest has it mostly just been achies and hurties? No, no major injuries, no surgeries. T touch with no surgeries, but yeah. uh, a couple of broken or fractured knuckles, and I, I don't think I've got any toes that bend anymore. <laughs> 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 the curse of the my Gary. Oh, um, yes. But uh, yeah, no, I t touch with nothing too awful, but yes. Yeah. And after all these years, and actually just speaking about the mic, Gary, do you have a favorite or a couple favorite go-to techniques that you find that just always come out of, comes out of your repertoire? Well, you know, I think I do. And then when I do another tournament and I do something that I've right. never done before and I'm like, oh, I like that one now. Um, 
it's really strange. I always think like, oh yeah, this is my good technique. I'm really good at this technique. And then I go to a tournament and do like a completely different technique and it does really well in like three fights. And I'm like, well, this is my new technique. Um, so <laughs> yes and no. I, uh, yeah, I, it, you're good at what you train, aren't you? So right. if, you, if you spend loads of time training a certain thing or a certain combination, then nine times out of 10, that's the thing that should feel good in the competition. But sometimes it can just be so random. And I'm like, oh, whose leg was that? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so now you you've been doing kyokushin since you were like nine years old it was nine right so how would what would you say kyokushin means to you now after all this time how would you how would you define it your personal take on it yeah um quite, i suppose it's quite a difficult question but yeah it is yeah it is um i think like, I'm someone that I would never, ever profess to know or understand exactly what Budo is. Um, but I, from what I know, um, the little I know, um, Sosai sort of built a fighting style. Um, and within that fighting style, he built a sport karate. Um, and so you're, you're, you know, what that, because like we said earlier, Kyokushin is, is the, it's the strongest karate, isn't it? Mm. And you can take your own away from you can take your own kind of feelings away from that but I suppose to me the challenge of like putting myself on the mat time after time knowing that yeah do you know what I could I could get hurt here and um you you know you put yourself out there uh I suppose for me that's that it's that challenge of like knowing that I I can do this mm -hmm. that's my but obviously for everyone it can be super different and um, and there's definitely people that will have a kid, but like I said, better take on things like what Kyokushin actually means and what Budo means than I do. Um, mm. But it's it's all personal to exactly. me. Exactly, so and it should whatever, be. Yeah, whatever mine is and whatever someone else's is, it, that that's cool because that's yeah. Yeah, one person will could be it's all about the perseverance that I've learned. Another one it could be the physical. Yeah, so that's why I'm always curious as what their own someone's own personal uh, take on it is. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Well, I suppose I love a challenge, so there we go. Yeah, yeah. and uh, have you found it's played a part in your personal life as well? Like uh, again, like all that discipline, all that training, has it flooded over into other areas, or has influenced it uh, positive or negatively <laughs> as well? It definitely has. I suppose you start like when it's something that you do over and over again. It it, it is it's kind of intrinsically built into your life. So. Um, I mean, my, like, loads of my friends and loved ones, I wouldn't have even met them had it not been for karate. And, um, you, you know, you go out for dinner with some friends and you think, God, I wouldn't even be here if I didn't do karate. Um, I suppose it uh, it kind of it, it travel. Like, I love I love traveling. Um, and in 2000, I think it was 2011, um, I, went, I did like a little round the world tour mm. and I went to loads of different countries. But... I went to all places that I could go somewhere and go and train or do a fight, do, do something. Um, and I don't know whether I would have perhaps been brave enough to have done that if I didn't know that each place I was going, right. there'd, be, there'd be a dojo. And there was another dojo. Like, um, it kind of, yeah, it kind of gave me maybe like a little bit of false bravery to go and to go ahead and yeah, travel alone around the world. Um, and also, yeah, the fact that you go to so many places that you would never have even known exist. Um, mm because of it uh, yeah I, I guess it's it's massively you can't imagine a, a day without it really you right just, it's there every day it depends you know sometimes you're a little bit sort of taking care of what you eat a little bit more or how much you sleep and things like that and it, that's because you're training for an event or mm. yeah so it's it's there all the time mm. and speaking of traveling i was looking at uh was it last year you were in japan was that last was it was yeah, yeah. I, was, I was quite envious beautiful photos and stuff how was that event or how was that uh uh well it was event there as well but how was it traveling japan and seeing all these things yeah i mean it, it's so nice i think that was my fourth time there. oh god I'm jealous no, I'm, i know i'm so lucky um and i've got friends there as well which means that when i get there i i get like a really kind of honest real japan um experience so i i do really love it when i when i've been and um, it was for the Shin Kyokushin, wasn't it? It was. So we went yeah. as part of the KWU team. So yeah. KWU got to enter um, 
a team into the Shinkokushin World Tournament. Um, and, you know, it's always tough. You, you're flying in two days before, which is prime jet lag day to fight. Um, and, yeah, and you, you, you know, maybe you feel a little bit on the back foot when you, when you start and it, it's tough. But, you know, I, I went there with no, um, no sort of preemptive thoughts about what was going to happen. I'm just going to go and I'm going to fight my best. And then that is it. I'm going to, you know, when I've done my best, that's cool. Like that, and that, again, that's all you can really do, isn't it? Mm. Uh, but yeah, and then I got to stay in Japan for, for a while later. But then we came, you came home and I think we were home for like a, a week or even. Yeah. And then back out to Kazakhstan, which was another huge time difference. So by the end, of, by the time we got home from Kazakhstan, I think the bags under my eyes were like, I was like a zombie. <laughs> and just sleep for a week. Was, was that tough going from Japan, the event, the travel, and then going right to that other? Uh... Yeah, the back and forth was definitely tough. I mean, I think the day before the tournament in Kazakhstan, I, I just slept in my room like all day. Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, it wasn't easy. Um, but you know, you do what you got, you do what you do and you, you try not to think about the fact that it's hard at the time and only at the, after you can look back and you're like, God, I was a machine last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And what about outside of Kyokushin, any other interest hobbies that you do? I mean, you know, you don't have loads of time, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do love to see uh, some of my girlfriends and things like that. And I specifically always try and take a week or two off after a tournament and make some special plans to go and see them, maybe go out mm. for a few drinks and let my hair down and um, chill a little bit. So that's that's all quite precious time because I know that I don't get to do it all year round. Um, and then I I suppose a lot of the other things that, have, that I enjoy have come because of a love of karate and training. So I, I really like... Uh, yoga so I like practicing yoga on, on my own um and I like cooking um although I particularly like cooking cakes and then I eat <laughs> and then, ah, uh, <laughs> but they're delicious so um yeah no I uh yeah a, a little bit but it doesn't give you loads of time to do loads of other things yeah but you had enough time to start out Mark Will Fitness Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's another aspect now that you're doing coaching and stuff. So what type of what, what exactly is Markle Fitness and what kind of coaching and stuff are you doing? Because I don't think it's just martial arts focused. No, no, you're right. Yeah. So um, it's my personal training business mm. and I started it up. What are we now? Uh, about five years ago, I think, or just over five years ago now. Um, and I go to clients homes or I meet them in local parks so a lot of some of my clients are people that maybe didn't have the confidence to step into a gym or something like that in the first mm -hmm. place which I really like because I'm I'm I, well again we'll go back to right at the start when you had to like basically convince me into talking on camera um, <laughs> I'm a little bit shy myself so I, I kind of understand that feeling of walking into a gym and feeling a little bit like well this is a little bit scary um so I I like to try and instill a bit of confidence in other people as well um and yeah I, I do a lot lots of different lots of different things with my clients like some people are there because they're training for an event like a half marathon or marathon and epic bike rides and things like that which is really nice and fun because it's event training but it's not karate mm -hmm. so you have to think a little bit differently to what, what I need they need something different um but I also train people um anti and postnatal training oh. and yeah yeah mums to be and people with little ones and things like that um I qualified as a Pilates mat work instructor cool. and so I do a bit of that one-to-one -one as well um and also like lots of my clients love hitting the boxing pads so <laughs> uh, which is really cool because I mean who doesn't love hitting things and uh you know you're, you feel a like you're you're teaching them a bit of a skill at the same time. So people find that quite, um, just it's, it's motivating, isn't it? To know that I'm not only getting a bit fitter, but I'm learning something too. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's, that's what I'm doing on, a, on my day to day job. Are, are they aware of like who their coach is? <laughs> like this world <laughs> champion, like usually not at the start. Um, yeah. But with like a, a few sessions in or something, I might have said something about like going to somewhere random in 
another country and they'll be like why are you going there and I'll be like oh yeah and then yeah it will, it will come out eventually and they'll be like what and then normally the next session I get like my husband and I've been watching you on YouTube <laughs> and I'm like ah, I'm not I'm not really aggressive honestly <laughs> um, yeah. how, how do you balance all this stuff like you got so you do Markle Fitness you're doing prep training for all this you know tournaments or just actually just training in karate uh life friends do you find it hard to balance at all uh yeah i mean i've got a lot better at it as i've got older yeah. um probably when i was younger i was a little bit more hectic and like uh, you know running from pillar to post but now i i think i respect my rest days a little mm -hmm. bit more now I'm like yeah you and me rest days we're good yeah. um <laughs> but i mean you're i think with every job you do you're always going to find some like I haven't got time or, you know, I, I mean, I get up at 4.50 a.m. four times a week. Um, Good Lord, you do? Yeah, um, which is at the moment I'm not because obviously coronavirus. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and usually I four times a week I'm up before 5 a.m. And, and then, you know, when you're doing all of your own training on top of that, yeah, like it can be exhausting. Yeah. Um, so if you're but, up at 4.50, what time are, do you generally get to sleep when, when you are on that schedule? Uh, I'm, I try to be in bed by like maybe 10 30. Um, yeah. so I never quite get enough sleep. Um, yeah. but who does? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you just, you just learn to balance it. Don't you, you kind of just have to, and you just go, right. Okay. That's, you know, that's the way that, that my business affords me time off in the middle of the day, for, for instance, right. where I can go and train in the middle of the day, which is really, really lucky. Um, lots of people uh, sat at a desk at that time and I'm in the gym or in the, yeah. you know. Um, so you just, yeah, you take the rough with the smooth, don't you? And I I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. Yeah, for, for me, it's it was trying to learn how to put personal boundaries in. Um, just, uh, and I mean that not just like being respectful of my own time, um, but also even, I guess, being a little bit more self-disciplined about um, making sure that I do stick to schedules. And, and I, I find if I don't, that's when things start becoming overwhelming and I just have too much going on. Oh, well, I love a spreadsheet. So, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I made myself a little, like, coronavirus timeless spreadsheet that I'm sticking to every day just, just to make sure I'm still being productive, but I'm taking some time off as well. Yeah, same for me. I'm working from home, but I make sure that like I have my gym time, yeah. my gym time, my workout time here, and that I stick to it. Because there has been days like eh, I don't really need to like I feel like I'm on a permanent vacation. Uh, no, but no. it is so important, and especially for working out, I always find. I mean, I mean, you must notice it too. After a workout, endorphins, whatever, I'd feel great. I feel way more optimistic about everything. Yeah. Well, actually, like my my business hasn't slowed down in all of this time because actually I'm oh, taking everything online. So that's great. Um, I'm still still as busy as, as ever. Um, but it's, a, it's an amazing feeling like that. I can look at someone on the computer and they an hour, an hour, an hour later, they're buzzing, smiling like, right. oh, that, like that's the best I have felt all day. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. Job, uh, job, like tick, job achieved. Um, so yeah, it's like a drug. I swear, if you could bottle that, you could sell it. Like it's incredible that feeling after. It's, it's. Yeah. I love it. No matter how tired I am when I go into it. So, do you have any further aspirations for for Kyokushin? More world tournaments in the horizon? Mm. Uh, I do have some personal goals, definitely, but I don't tend to kind of talk about them. They're kind of a little mm -hmm. bit for me to see if I get them. And, you know, we'll, maybe I'll tell you about them one day. Yeah, yeah <laughs> um, fair enough. Uh, more like long-term goals. I, I suppose I see myself, you know, doing Kyokushin forever. So mm -hmm. um, I do. I already do some teaching abroad and I'd love to do a little bit more of that. Um, just, you know, to keep regularly um, teaching seminars and things like that because I really enjoy it and I like to get to interact with different people from everywhere. Um, well, I know there's been, I don't, I don't even know if I should say this, but I know there was talk about trying to get you to come over here actually for a seminar. So I'm hoping when all this passes that that will still happen as well. I'll cross my fingers. Yeah. Um, have, have you you've been to Canada? Uh, I've been, but only on holiday, not, not for karate. Yeah, so um yeah, I mean, I'd love to come back. Mm. But um, yeah, so I see, my, I suppose I see myself doing a little bit more of that and 
always maybe taking a bit of a role within the organization somehow but probably not quite ready for that at this stage because I'm still on the tatami but um mm. I definitely see myself you know staying involved heavily throughout life yeah yeah IFK is a great organization it really is I really like how open um yeah I just yeah there's so much politics and everything but I don't know I just find less of it there I guess <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's there's Less always ego. Stuff, but um, I've always felt very free in the IFK. Mm. I've always felt like I've never felt that I've been pigeonholed or told I can't do something. I've always felt very free, and you know, as as long as you're respectful of the the right channels, then I've always found that you know the IFK has always allowed me to do kind of what I want to do which is what what more could you ask of an organization exactly and I also do like and you alluded to it earlier I like that there is a lot of focus on kihon kata the basics not just the, mm. the kumite uh, sports side of it so that I really like because there are certain people who you know eh, kata whatever or yeah. you know vice versa I guess could be as well so do yeah. you, uh, you still have a passion for both kata and uh it, yeah, it's funny actually. I um because I go long periods of time without doing it, and then if I if I do 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 some like if I if I have a break from a competition or something, and I do some, I go like I'm like I love this. <laughs> I want to do more of this. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, I I'd imagine I'll I'll enjoy it a lot to get back into stuff like that when you know when the time comes that I'm not fighting so much. But it is just yeah. time. You got to pick. You got to pick where you spend your time, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you could just do just full time all the time, only that thing, it'd be nice. But yeah, time is valuable. <laughs> um, and and actually, to that note, uh, and I've been talking to some other folks that have been fighting at like a high caliber. Um, when we do look at fighters like people who are perhaps from uh, Russia or or places like that, where they do have such a huge um, population base to draw from, so they do get the cream of the crop. Uh, and when they get those top fighters, that tends to be their job. Um, and I don't know if I, I believe they're financially supported along the way, but all their focus can be just training. Um, I'm pretty sure Great Britain doesn't have that same thing in system. No, I, I know it, the, not here we don't. Yeah, I don't know the ins and outs of some of those other countries. So I couldn't say. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm sure that yeah some of what we hear is is must must come from some truth that like yeah there is much more financial support in those countries and whether they yeah whether they don't have to work at all or whether their job is to teach right. karate um the, it's a different way of life isn't it for sure but I always just think do you know what if I can make myself do this when I'm super tired having like got up at 5am and and I'm doing it for the right reasons I'm not doing it because I'm financially rewarded or I'm not doing it because of um you know for security or anything like that I'm doing it because I love it um and at the moment for me it's a, it's enough of that like en that's enough for me and I've kind of accepted that over the years that yeah do you know what it's not going to pay the bills but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know uh I well, love it so. have you ever thought about going into something that uh that pays the bills, if you will, like kickboxing or, or things of that line yeah. or MMA I, or anything like that. No, I, I haven't. I did do a tie fight once many moons ago, yeah. um, which I did really enjoy. But again, like there's just more and more and more Kyokushin tournaments all the time. And so right. if you do want to do Kyokushin, then you can't be kind of cross training all, like all over the place. You kind of got to pick one and may, may, maybe somebody else would pick, the more financially rewarding um line but for me it was just yeah it was just about karate really mm -hmm. Do, and when you are training even even it's just kyokushin are you finding yourself um drawing from other sports or other things to bring into your training any kind of cross training that's happening yeah for sure um definitely a lot more when i'm kind of uh gym based and doing my weights training yeah. and things like that i'm drawing lots from kind of more athletic programs and um you know you, you've got to make sure things are relevant but if you can see like a you know um an exercise that works on rotational power or something for right. instance then you're like well that is super relevant for us and um so like throwing exercises are you know they're they're quite relevant for us and th things like that so i do find myself like maybe and i have a lot of help i have i have amazing coaches who yeah. do 
a lot of the work for me as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've always been really lucky with that. So I, yeah. Have you done any grappling? Uh, again, quite a long time ago, maybe around the age of like 20, mm. um, there was a, a really cool teacher that I, I used to go to his classes because yeah, I, I just really liked what he was teaching and I did a little bit more floor work and grappling then but mm. I mean that's like 10 years ago now and I, I kind of I suppose I left it there because again it wasn't so relevant in right. lockdown so it was like mm, I really like it but I could be spending that extra hour and a half on something that's a little bit more specific yeah and on that note as you we're all getting older when you do you see yourself like whatever 10 years from now 15 years from now do you foresee any other areas that you'll um probably pursue in your in your training whether it is more deeper into kata or bunkai or grappling for that matter or anything no, i don't know but i do know that i'll have to find something because i'll just be like what do i do with all this weird time <laughs> <laughs> so i know there'll be, i'm sure there'll be something but at the moment I, I haven't even thought that far ahead at all yeah no i get it and what about so are you are you doing any uh, teaching yourself? I know aside from Markle Fitness, are you doing any teaching in the dojo? Um, I do I do little bits, but I don't do loads. I will admit because again, my dojo sessions are um, sort of important to me to get my training right. in. So I yeah, I have to admit it's something that I definitely want to do a little bit more. Well, that's of. what I was alluding at. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. wondering if that's something that you'll get in because you mentioned seminars and stuff, which is. Yeah, quite yeah, and I definitely see again, like I was saying, um, if I have a role within the organisation, etc. I definitely yeah. see part of that, like being as a, you know, doing more, I, either doing more teaching at my own, do like at my the dojo I belong to, or maybe one day even having your own. I don't know, but I definitely see myself, you know, teaching, not just always joining the line. Sometimes joining the line because that's nice, isn't it? Isn't but it? um, yeah. you know, I. I do see myself teaching definitely, um, but I just don't do loads of it at the moment because, yeah, those those hours are important to my own training. You have to be a little bit selfish, really, I suppose. Yeah, and what? So on that note, for for maybe people who are watching this could be younger. Like I know we have, even at our dojo, there's some young folks that look up to you, uh, at, and we have people to the age of you know in their early teens up through mid teens. What kind of advice would you give them uh, as they're approaching uh without you know, sounding, high level tournaments without sounding like their mum um, yeah. <laughs> i'd probably say yeah do get off social media a little bit um uh. no uh you know just accept you know if you want to if you want to be successful at something accept that it's not always going to be glamorous um you know you get the glamorous day of lifting the trophy up but the rest of the time it can be really really hard work and if you can make peace with that and accept that then you're, you're good you know you, you'll be fine um but yeah you know just kind of focus and not so much shouting about everything on on instagram but <laughs> doing doing it first mm, that's good advice yeah so thank you so much for taking the time. I don't. I won't eat up any more of your time. Uh, any parting words? Anything you want to say to the folks listening or or watching? Yeah, um, I mean, always happy to like answer any questions or messages or anything. If so, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, that's you know just ping me on Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. But um, yeah, I'm, if anyone's you know if, if people have got to the end of this recording, then thank you for watching this long. <laughs> <laughs> you know to give um an hour or so of your time to watch me is you know i would never expect anyone to do that so thank you come on you're so <laughs> modest you're, you're a world champion of course people are gonna watch and listen <laughs> well thank you no it was really really great and uh i i i again i know you're a little hesitant about coming on so i really really appreciate it so much i'm so so thankful uh i was looking forward to this all weekend so uh, I really, really appreciate it. I know everyone watching and listening is going to as well. Uh, well, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me on. Maybe we'll do a follow-up. We went okay? Yeah. It was all right? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't too painful? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Emma. Have a great day. Us. Bye. Bye-bye.